and Sato's Place is brought to you by... Prince said our guest song was one of his all-time favorites. He won three Grammys. That's pretty big. We've got new ITLs. We've got contest information from Indaba. We're back at the place. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Everybody, everybody, welcome back. Welcome back. So good to see you again. Um, a lot going on. Let's just jump right in, Herbert. <laughs> there's a lot going on that we can't talk about yet. Isn't there? <laughs> That's why I tossed it to you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've received. There's, there's times when a bad memory helps you, you know? <laughs> if it ain't musical, I can't remember it anymore. Well, then I agree with you. Let's jump right in. Hey, guys, it is absolutely good to be back. Yes. Dave and I and Will, we've had a chance to have a little bit of a break, and we fed you some good stuff during that time. Excellent stuff. So, yeah, yeah. Um, really enjoyed the Let's Make a Deal episode and a whole bunch of other stuff, Neil and, and everybody. So, Oh, good to see you. Of course, we're coming to you live from the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles, yes, from our yes. beautiful HD studio, which stands for... Herbert and David. Herbert and David, absolutely. Not to be confused with the candy company. No question about it. Our social media information, as you know, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe there, and like us at Facebook. Very important really stuff. Really helps, really helps. Absolutely really helps. And um, hello to Vintage King. Prom wave. For some reason, I'm doing a lot of drumming today. Have you noticed that? It's just your, your, it's the black thing in you, the rhythm thing. I prefer to say it's the Latin American Spanish. That, that works as well, too. Cool. Afro-Cuban, let's call it that. I like that. Very good, very you good. You know what, in Miami, where I, where I spent half my life in Tampa, it was all Cuban. There you go, and that's why you're drumming. That's why I like Ricky Ricardo, Baba Lou. Back to the matters at hand. Remember Baba Lou, do you? do they. <laughs> nor do they, more importantly. Anyways, hey, Vintage King, good to see you. Uh, Jeff Leibovich is in the chat room. We've got a Stuff Jeff. the V Cake Eye question. Why don't you reel that boy off? Jeff, um, two-part question. Um, from time to time, I'll take a ground lift and put it on my power cord and then flip the, the plug in the receptacle to get rid of ground loops and hums. Is that okay? And when is it not okay to take a pair of wire clippers and just clip off the, the, the ground pin? Very good. So you know you'll be able to find that answer. Look underneath our video when you see it. Um, uh, uh, as usual, we say hello to our avid friends and just want a quick update and something we want to refer you to. Pro Tools 11 has just been announced. Um, there's a lot of great features and a lot of focus on the AAX architecture. So for reference, we had Bobby Lombardi, who is beyond brilliant, uh, from Avid, a good friend of the shows. Go to our website, check out episode 88. There's a lot of information there that he talked about it coming, and then we'll address all the stuff we as it moves we forward. We dispel quite a few of the myths. Absolutely, and yeah. we, will, we will figure that out and work with our way, partners. By the way, 11, it, I can't wait, it's gonna be a beast. Oh, cool. It's gonna be a beast. Cool, great to, great to know that. And our buddies at Indaba, right? Hold on, I got a quote about 11. Sure, go ahead. 11, 11 didn't get a boob job, it got a heart transplant. So That's is, how new it is. It's a it, major, it, it major redo. I'll give you a hint. There's no DAE anymore. Wow. It's Avid Audio Engine now. Oh, cool. It, it got a heart transplant. Cool. So there you go. We'll, we'll, I stole we'll, that quote from Russ Hughes. So. <laughs> we'll guide you through that. Um, and in our, in our Indaba, look, we're going to be doing these contests a bunch. We've got interviews with the latest winners on our website. Get to pensadosplace.tv and look for that. Um, uh, the winners were Darian Calgill and Jared Micklett. So make sure you go see their interviews. Dave talked with them briefly, mm -hmm. and uh, good stuff there. Go to our website. We're going we're gonna to start doing these contests fairly regularly. You can get the information from our website. All good stuff. Got a great Into the Lair. Glad to be back with you. Why don't you introduce that, and let's rock it. Okay. Uh, this week's Into the Lair has its foundation in an old school technique that I tried to modify and bring to life today. Check it out, I think you're gonna like it. What's up? Trying to put together a, a cool idea for an ITL and I started thinking about some old school techniques that maybe we could do inside Pro Tools and so I spent a little time creating an old school ducking uh, example for you and then I started thinking, what the hell's the difference between ducking and side chaining? Back in the day, I made my own compressor because I couldn't afford one. <laughs> and I realized 
but it was just an internal side chain that I created to do a ducking technique. So back in the day, it was used. You'd put you'd, you'd put the guitars through a compressor, and then you'd put uh, the vocals through the side chain. And when the guitars, when the vocal came in, the guitars would drop down automatically. That's still used a lot, by the way, and it's a great technique in the analog world. And then there's a couple of places like the drummer. Uh, Echo Farm has a ducking. But anyway, I digress. What I'm going to show you today is a way to get feedback on a delay old school style. Dave, I got a perfectly working feedback button. Why don't I just slide this feedback bucket button over to something and get the feedback I want? Well, you could do that, but what does feedback do? It takes, it takes the delay and it sends a piece of the delay back into itself. Now that, that piece comes back out the delay and gets fed back into itself and that's why it's feeding back. It's a loop and that's how we get the delays and as the, as the feedback goes through it becomes less and less and less in volume. So I'm sitting there thinking, well that's kind of boring. Now what if I take and put something on the before the delay so that every time the feedback goes through something new happens. Okay, so I decided let's take a bit crusher, let's take lo-fi or any 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 effect you want. It can be like a um a high pass filter, low pass filter. So now every time the signal goes back through the delay on the feedback cycle, it gets more and more and more of that of that effect added to it. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's, here's my vocal. It's coming out of this track here that says hush. I'm just rolling a little low end off. So here's, here's the track with nothing. Hush. Oh, pretty cool. Okay, now if I wanted to delay, I can take it and send it to 61 and 62. I'm using two mono auxes because that I, I, need, I want ping ponging. So on this, on 61, I've got a quarter note delay, no feedback. This one, I've got a half note delay, no feedback. So let's check that out. Okay, so you only hear two delays. First one left, first one right. Listen again. Okay, now what I'm gonna do, pay attention. The left delay is being fed from bus 61. I'm gonna send a piece of, of the right delay back to the left delay. Now let's listen to that. Hear that? We gotta repeat. Now let's do the same thing the other way. So we've, we've created our own feedback loop. Now the fun part. Let's degrade, every time the signal goes back through, let's degrade it a little bit. But you can use anything you want. I'm using lo-fi. Okay. Now watch this. Pretty cool, huh? Now you can control the decay. I've got it set up so it's, it's just gonna stay the same, but it degrades every time. Now, I wanted to take a little bit of the top end off just to make it uh, a little less grainy. So, experiment with that, try different things. You, you could try, you know, like I said, uh, a real narrow bandwidth. You could automate the bandwidth so each time the delay cycles back through, it would have a different tone. Uh, you could you could automate a pitch shifter. Each time the delay comes through, it'd be a different note. So there's all kinds of techniques you can use once you have access to that feedback loop. Okay. All right, guys. Next time. Welcome back, guys. Make sure that you use that ITL, and uh, if you've got any questions, hit us. Dave will make sure we answer. We are happy to bring to you a guy coming off kind of the pinnacle 
of what they do, wouldn't you think? Number one for like 800 years. 800 years and three Grammys. We are welcome to our desk, please, Mr. Francois Titaz. How are you, man? Very well. Good, 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 good. To, oh, lovely wait, to be wait, here. Here's, here's a three-way yeah. pound. Thank you, Dave. That's, you, you're going to have to come up with something new. I like that. It <laughs> makes me laugh. It like six times in a row. So It still makes me laugh. Man, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, we have a sure. lot, lot to cover. We're going to have a bunch of fun. Dave, why don't you... Kick off the Man, first let's thing. just jump right in. We got so much. Man, thanks for being on the show. Your your cat that I've admired for a long time. Dare I say, I feel a kindred shit with some of the things you do, and uh, your records have inspired me. Let's jump right in. Um, you you kind of came from started. You, you you wear so many hats, like you were an artist. I'm particularly fascinated by your film and composing uh, for film career. You uh, you were nominated for an Oscar with a short film. And then uh, you won, what was the award you won for um, Wolf Creek? Um, yeah. It's the Australian Guild of Screen Composers Award, so it's a, voted by other screen composers as the yeah, feature um, score of the year. Yeah. Is, yeah, there a, is there a symbiosis between the, the film side and the making record sides? I mean, do they have an overlap of any, any type? Uh, I think they definitely do. Well, certainly composition does, uh -huh. um, very much so. They're you know, intricately related. Uh, I always, well, one of the reasons why I love going between film and making records is that uh, so much of what I use in either fields crosses over. Um, and so, yeah, there's very much a, yeah, there's a strong relationship between them, very much so, yeah. If, if, uh, if you guys are just tuning in, we're going to talk a little bit about um, uh, somebody I used to know, the Gautier record, uh, Moving Mirrors. But um, so if I say uh, somebody, I'm referring to that song. <clears throat> The, uh, the, the creative process that you and uh, uh, Gautier, Wally, from here on out, I don't like saying Gautier, so, <laughs> there's some words I can't say. I'll try and say it as many as, as good as I can. But you guys, the creative process you guys used to, on that record and, and prior records is pretty fascinating. Uh, can you give me a brief overview, like, like for example, that entire record was done on Ableton Live, Pro Tools, and a laptop. Even the vocals were recorded through yeah. the mic and a laptop. Not all of them, but some of them. Yeah. I mean, wow. Uh, it's what you have at hand. Uh, the, the first rec record we worked on together, Wally had a, a, a PC, just a generic PC, and he had Fruity Loops, programmed Fruity Loops. Mm -hmm. And so when he was uh, taking loops from records, he would just you know, sample it, put it into Fruity Loops. I think he recorded into Fruity Loops also. He just mm -hmm. had whatever microphone. I think he had one microphone, mattresses up in his bedroom. Yep, and uh, there's fan noise all over the vocal takes. <laughs> yeah, it was all over the place. Um, but uh, we like fan noise. Oh, here. love fan noise. He, uh, <laughs> but yeah, he. It's a very much a um, find what you can, gather things, then mm -hmm. make things out of that. And for Wally, his process creatively is that he generally starts a song or an idea from finding something that resonates with him. Could be any sound, could be any starting point. And then it'll just follow a tangent, it'll add things to it, it'll turn into something. And he makes them, they're like little Lego kits, you know? Mm -hmm. He'll just assemble a bunch and he'll have them sitting there and then he might have an idea for it. Little mightn't. samples, little pieces yeah, of records, yeah. little pieces of... Yeah, and then he just keeps tinkering and making them, and they, they take their own form. Some of them are difficult because, you know, they're like puzzles. You sort of start this part of the puzzle and then it doesn't have anywhere to go or you can't find another section, but it's like that. So he approaches the same thing with production or a lot of those, which is mm. whatever mic he's got at hand. Mm. And if it's not working, then you change it up. But certainly, the, the, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting process. I think it was two, well, it's him recording on his laptop or vocals on his laptop, that kind of thing came from just a frustration of not being able to get a vocal tone out of another microphone and just... Wow pressing record and, and, and going, oh, this sounds great. And it's got distortions all over it and, mm -hmm. and whatever that I, I had to deal with. And, well, but, you know, the performance was great and it worked really well. So we thought, well, there you go. It's, uh, there's it's, the vocal. Did somebody, did it start with that Louis Bonfa uh, acoustic guitar, the yeah. three notes? Yeah, yeah. That was the starting point for him with that. So that, yeah. that was the nucleus but, that gave him the idea for yeah, the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, yeah, when he brought it to me, I didn't. I heard it when he'd written a verse and a chorus. Mm. So at that stage, and it was sort of it had the vibe. Like by the time you, you know, when you heard the chorus, you went, "Wow, this is a really, this is a really good, beautiful song." Mm. But it was sort of in that half point of how to complete it. Where is it going to go to next? 
yeah, as a song. Speaking of chorus, did you intentionally, like you guys pretty much broke every rule of pop music, mm -hmm. and yet you had the number one selling record for the year, number one five weeks. Um, so you created the greatest pop record by not creating a pop record. You created a, 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 a Francois and Wally record, you know. Mm. But the chorus, it, the chorus doesn't come in for a minute and a half. I mean, yeah. that's the kiss of death in the pop world. Yeah. And then it only happens twice, and you never hear it again. Yeah. And then you want to play it again. You know, speaking of the pop world, um, a lot of pop records have that sound that, that, that's somewhat pervasive, and I think it has to do with the short attention span that we as a culture have. Mm. Mm -hmm. including myself. So everything is up front, you get everything. There's no appetizers anymore. You get your meal first and it's fully blown. There's no dynamics or the dynamics are, are, are utilized to keep that attention for that one listen. Do you think the popularity of that song is, is due to the fact that, that there's, you didn't over compress it and there's a lot of dynamics and, and it, it, it starts so slow and then builds is that part of the popularity of it? Just uh, I think there's a lot of things that go into it. The, I mean, it's a really great song as a story, and I think hook, it's yeah. so different to, and it's very powerful as a song, mm -hmm. um, and its relationship to other things in pop music at this time, um, you know, there's a lot of things that played into the song's mm -hmm. favour, mm -hmm. but certainly the all the ideas... Um, well, yeah, all the ideas that we're trying on that song were very much to do with the song musically. And we had to counter the idea of um, this isn't a radio song because I just thought it's a good song. I don't know whether radio is going to play it. And certainly what happened when the song first came out and was being played on radio in Australia is that commercial networks didn't know what to do with it because it didn't fit their exactly. format. And they put beats on it and they, and we, <laughs> and they did all sorts of like oh, literally yeah. in-house beats on uh, out-of-time beats on it uh, to try and make it fit formats. And which I, I was kind of concerned about, well, is this thing song going to kind of, you know, fall over or not go anywhere because it doesn't sit within a genre or within a form. Um, but it was interesting just to watch it play out with people having a very natural connection with it or, you know, through YouTube and mm -hmm. but having a real musical connection with it as a song. So mm -hmm. it didn't it actually got outside that in a way. It just was about the song, that, not about genre or form. Or, and I, and yeah. I thought that is exactly part of the reason. I mean, yeah. there's Kimber and there's other kinds of things that. Yeah. But. Yeah. But the fact that it was different is mm. partly what made it stand up, yeah. uh, stand alone. Yeah. And a lot of records that are Lumineers and other kinds of things, mm. the things that are not fitting, yeah. this because we're so tired of being fed the same thing. So, yeah. so between the emotional connection, structural differences, and it being different, once it stood up, you just couldn't put that boy down. Yeah. It, was, yeah. it was a slow build, but once it got mm. there, oh mm. my goodness. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> uh, on, on, on not, just, not just somebody, but on Easy Way Out and... Um, um, Eyes wide open. Your your the use of dynamics is hmm. is pretty special. I mean, it's it's not it's it's there's a slight homage to the old school, but you're doing something brand new with the dynamics. You're you're competing with the 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 loudness wars in a rather unique way. Your record is not wimpy, but yet you still have dynamics. Was that was that? The song telling you to do that is that a philosophical thing for you? It's a bit of it's a bit of both. With Walls, with what happens when you're constructing, because his records are constructed a lot from lo-fi samples. There'll be MP3 samples, or there'll be little cuts from records, um, old records, records that are in terrible nick. Um, so you know, really bad condition. When they when they come in and you hear them, like he's put it together, they very much sound like very small ideas. They don't sound if you put it on next to a big production record, it sounds like a tiny kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And essentially, my job with Wall is um, to try and take that idea on the scale that it is, and then blow it up into something where it would play alongside other things that are at a completely different scale, but yeah. maintain the essence or the essence of the vibe within those things. And so really, that's very much what those dynamics come out of, because I am very much trying to mix it like a hip hop record. You know, mm -hmm. um, for me, it's like I'm treating this as though it is, it's... Well, let yeah. me interrupt you, because you, you found a way to make the widest sounding hip hop record ever. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds but weird, very cool. but <laughs> you took, very you cool. took, you took hip hop philosophy, you took mm. everything but the clothing mm. and, and managed to get it in a song your way. Mm. And maintain mm. this kind of intimate thing, yeah. this essence of what you're talking about, which is really spectacular. Yeah, and it must have been very difficult to do. 
Yeah, uh, a lot of time. I think it, well, yes. I mean, it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, the main thing is you lose the vibe. I think it's very easy to lose the essence of what they are when you blow those up. And certainly what, what I would do with Wally as a process is he would give me an idea, I'll give you an idea of that process. We've got a working process where for mixing, when we get into, we're actually finishing a song, have the song and have all the parts in Pro Tools. He'd come in and we'd listen to it and I'd get him to make a list and we'd just talk through the song creatively. So he'd mm. say, I really, this, these are the things I really want to hear in this song. And so I'd make a note of those to make sure that I'm really aware of that. I'll have his rough mix that he has. And then basically he leaves me alone for a good day, two days for just doing, you know, all the basics. And there's a lot of manipulation on those samples to get them from a scale of being like a little scratchy thing into something that's much broader as a sound. And a lot of those techniques you're talking about in dynamic, mm. uh, very much just to make that happen so mm. it can play alongside something else. And then generally I will try and make it as, the first step for me is making it as close to the world you're describing as I can, yeah. starting from these low, because the sound sources, it's not like you've got some hi-fi sound source. The sound sources are generally pretty ordinary, but that's what makes them so special because you're trying so hard to take this little tiny thing and you're talking about big boosts of EQ and if you hear the original sounds and whatever, they, they generally they need a lot of work to even be able to have that, or you're searching for what the essence of the sound is right. that you're trying to put into an arrangement. Um, but so there'd be that, and a lot of times I would take it too far and I'd do something and, and Wally would come in and just go, I'm just not into this at all. It feels as though that snare drum's way too bright and, and I, you know, and I hate it, like, you know, what's going on with the, and, and for me it's like, I'm trying to make it as big as I can and then we can then, Draw, draw it in yeah. and then find where it kind of fits mm. rather than being at this edging kind of process like that. Mm. Um, and that's a process that works with Wally really well. Um, uh, and it's a fun thing to do, but it's so easy when you do that because you blow it up and you can quite easily just lose the essence of the song. Mm -hmm. And it has no, the original character of it was so beautiful and you listen to the demo and you go, oh, it's got this yeah. atmosphere and this thing and now I've made it into this, you know, grotesque uh, <laughs> beast of whatever. It doesn't have any musicality and I'd lose the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a tricky balance. Francois, yeah. well, you bring up a great point and let me, let me, let me emphasize, re-emphasize this to our audience. Sometimes our job as an engineer mm. is not to give our client exactly what they want, but to give them way more than they want mm and then let them pick and choose, yeah. keep the atmosphere, not destroy it mm -hmm. when, when they don't want an idea, and then, uh, and then everybody kind of wins. Another observation, you're, 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 what you and Wally did, mix-wise, you, 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 when I hear a, a record that's essentially a lot of lo-fi sounds, I think 90s, I think Wu-Tang, I think a lot of the guys from that time period, but you made a modern sounding record with lo-fi sounds. Uh, it's too broad a question to ask you how you did that, but in the course of some of these other questions, kind of sneak that in for me, because <laughs> uh, are you using transient designers, or what are you? Uh, oh, oh yeah, totally. I use a lot of dynamic, a lot of dynamic work. So, because a lot of those sounds don't have transients on them, or they've been really compressed in the first place. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that work is very much from re really trying to articulate uh, the beginnings of sounds and making them sit. So a lot of, I don't know if it's in a bunch of my mixes that I can remember, but I can remember doing a lot of it. Um, yeah, that marimba, that opening marimba. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So making those. crazy on the transient designer on that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, but to try and make that, it's also about scale. I think the thing is the, the feeling that something's, finding that thing that feels very close to you and finding those things that are right in the distance. And the depth of that is something that also gives you, I think, a sense of something that, is more or modern in a, you know what I mean? It's not like everything's just sitting on the scale here. It's got an immense depth of, you know, depth of field in the mix. Um, yeah, and that was something that we were really trying to do. It was very, it was also, yeah, Wally and I talk about that. When we got to the end of the record, we, we always thought, um, when we got through mastering, he te I, we were listening to the master and whatever, and I think he sent me a text saying, what, you know, what do you think? What do you think of the, the master? And I said, and I think it was like the fourth revision on the record or something, mm -hmm. we got to this stage. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do you think? And I said, oh, I think it sounds good. And then he typed back going, good? Like in that <laughs> alarm, <laughs> like, it's only about. just oh, good. Yeah, I was so. like, well, you know, it's, you know, but good in that sense that's, of like, that's, that's as much yeah. as we've done everything we can. And we were still frustrated with the sound, like, like, you know, you're always trying to make something that yeah. stand, like really was going to stand the test of time and be well, really amazing. So a clear vision, that's so important. Yeah, but the striving was the thing. You're always keeping going for that, yeah. yeah. Where, did, mm. where did Kimbra come in the mix? We tried with that, um, the song after, 
we hit upon the fact that the second verse had to be a retort to the other side of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm really into male-male duets. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I would like there to be more male-male duets in the world. That's just me personally. I don't know about that. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and either that is a friendship thing. Normally they get really cheesy when you have a friendship, you know, like um, a two guy kind of ballad, but I just really like it. It's an unusual thing, you know. Right. Uh, so, so you want more wham? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. That's my point. It's like, you know, yeah, yeah. In, yeah. in Herbert Mann's world, maybe more Sam and Dave. Yeah. <laughs> but to try and bring that, so uh, anyway, while he tried, um, while he tried singing it himself and as a different character to see what it would be like as a friendship thing. And that really didn't work at all. It was really not working. Mm -hmm. And then we went through a, a few different singers, um, one of which was the, just the character was, uh, well, two of them, the character went right. And we had a third singer that um, it just didn't work out for uh, other reasons. Uh, and then, it, you know, this is over three or four months of mm -hmm. trying these people. So by the time you get to that point, you're kind of getting worn out. And I'd been working with um, Kimbra, um, I co-wrote her record and we'd worked a lot together and she had the personality I thought um, as a person who could really sing those lyrics um, she got an amazing voice so that came into you know being through that process uh, and um, yeah she did a demo did a demo of it home and then did another um, another version of it um, uh, and it came up came up really well I thought yeah uh, incredible yeah yeah yeah, yeah. No, yeah no but it was a long by the time we got to that stage it was almost everyone giving up you know right. is that is this song ever going to work you know right. after trying that many times so yeah. oftentimes it's right when that moment happens yeah and, and, and yeah yeah right so in. it was good yeah I want, I want our audience to know this our, our viewers you've heard that record a, a hundred million times I want you to listen to it again and I want you to listen to it with these ears this man is fearless. Um, this man will do a 20 dB booster cut at the drop of a hat. I mean, am I exaggerating? No, no, no. I, I hear, I hear t tens all over the place, twelves all over the place. Like, like, like the, like the, the way you sucked out the 300 on the kick drum. That's, that's you. You're, you're, you're bold. I mean, is, is that what you is? I don't know how to phrase a question around that. I, I love it. You're fearless. Uh, I think I, I try and attempt, because mixing is part of what I do uh, as a compositional process, and I sort of see it very similar to the way you would choose instruments and the way you work with them. It's a very similar thing. You can have a character in the recording process that you're trying to get with a sound that where you put a microphone at its distance or it's mm -hmm. dull using a ribbon microphone, a condenser, or whatever to find a character. And quite often with that, especially in mixing, is that you can have a deft hand. You can be trying to say, well, this is the intention of it. In the case of Wally, because the samples are so all over the place, when you're trying to put them back together and make them and changing the scale so much, it requires really big chunks of wood to be hacked off to be able to make it then go from there to there, but then attain the same, because you're trying to keep the same idea of it. And you do the craziest things, because you just you turn something up miles and you think, oh, it's got to sit here. I want this to sit here as a sound. And then to make it do that, all these other things come out of it that you then have to try and, but then they just, you know, it's like this weird jigsaw puzzle. So you end up making these big cuts and boosts <laughs> and, and you turn things up miles, Man. you know, as a thing to make it happen. But you, know but you feel, have to have the confidence to do it. It feels to me, yeah. Francois, like, like sometimes when on a situation where, where I would take a sound and just turn it up in the mix, mm. you just turn the frequency that's important up. Like, screw the stuff I don't need. Let me just yeah. get that 1K up there. Yeah, yeah. And then you did another thing I really love the acoustic guitar, the guitar and the chorus on somebody, it gets brighter as the chorus goes on, doesn't it? Uh, I can't remember the automation on it. It's definitely got, it'd have, oh yeah, it does. It has a new, oh, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> um, I know it has another version of the guitar that's been, um, it's side-chained and it has another distortion on it and it oh. comes up, so the brightness of it comes through that. And that's certainly automated. There'd be a shape on that, but I can't remember. And you, yeah. you, you, you side chained the guitar and the kick. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> that, that song is subtly very cutting edge. Your 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 techniques and the things you used. Uh, when I started studying it on headphones, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is. And I I, I have to I have to confess. The, the melody is so powerful, and I'm such a sucker for melody. I missed it, some of that the first time through. Uh, quickly, you and I have, have a couple of books that we both like, and I think, I think they're big help if we share that with our audience. Um, uh, 
uh, this is your brain on music, the Levitin book, mm. and then the uh, the Huron book, uh, something expectations. What is that book? Um, the psychology yeah. of expectations. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> psychology of expectations. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Guys, look up those books. They were published in two thousand six. Uh, I think you and I both have, have learned a lot from those mm. books. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, yeah. The major thing that I like in the certainly in your brain on music that I like a lot is there's a chapter that's um, where um, he's sitting with an old professor. I think he was in his you know seventies or whatever, and and um, uh, and he says to the author, um, uh, can you play me some of the music that you like or music that you hear? It's completely disconnected. He's from a you know, different age and whatever. And he comes around and he plays his professor these uh, songs. You know, and I, I can't remember what songs they were. Pink Floyd and the Stooges and a whole bunch of different things. Um, and all the comments that the professor made were about the texture of the music. They're about the... the um, the sounds with it, the harshness, the the color, the the tonal color of the music, and I always find that really interesting. Especially, you know, I've got kids, I've got three daughters, and the way they respond to pop music in instantaneously. If I if I put on a song and it has a loud kick drum and a big synth at the beginning of it, within half a second, a second, they haven't even heard the pitch, they haven't heard the lyric, or anything else. They'll say, "I love this," <laughs> based on a thing immediately, just based not more or less just on the texture of those instruments together. I do, I do the so, same thing. <laughs> yeah, but you do. You go, "I love the I love the sound of this," and yeah. I find that really fascinating. That you can uh, the texture of something, the overall texture of something, can be as fundamental to the other ideas that are within. And, and so a lot of what I try and work with or think about is that texture, the overall texture of a song, not just the individual elements or what it's trying to express, express musically. Right, yeah. Right. But also you, 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 the, the concept of, of manipulating and managing the expectations. Yeah. When, when I listen to, especially somebody on headphones, um, every four bars you're surprising me with a mm. new expectation. Mm. Some things I expect and some things I don't, but the way you manipulate that is, is pretty spectacular. Are, 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 we, are we batter's box time? I'm getting ready to throw you the rosin bag. Uh oh. Catch it, very good. You ready for batter's that's, box? That's acting. Right, right. That, I learned that from well, Steven Slate um, doing his video. I, with, I see. I, I went, he's got, I don't know if you know, he's got an acting academy. I see, and Stephen I, Slate I saw your performance from yeah. it. Great, I'm, yeah. I'm gonna go meet with him. Okay. Um, you ready? Okay. Dave Fire. Acoustic guitar. Uh, Nick Drake. Mm. Piano. Um, Scriabin. What the hell's that? He's a composer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Don't do that anymore. Oh, sorry. Uh, bass. Oh, um, Daryl yeah. Jones. Give me a plug in. Oh, bass. Oh, um, ah. ooh, 1176. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That was good. Okay. <laughs> Limiter. Ah. Uh, oh. Um, I'll give you a hint. It begins ooh. with an L. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, L3. I told you. I like L3. Mm. Uh, reverb. Uh, ultiverb. Okay. Mm. You, you use uh, speaker speakerphone a lot, speaker don't you? Speakerphone a lot. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. I hear that a lot. That's one of my favorites. Mm. Uh, distortion. Oh, Marshall. Mm. Plexi? <laughs> Plexi, yeah. Um, if your favorite vocal mic under $1,500. Oh, oh um, well, that's quite something. Maybe uh, um, an 87. Mm. Okay, excellent. Tape saturation. Oh, love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not Phoenix? Oh, Phoenix, I love Phoenix. Okay. Oh, the head, Crane Song head. Okay. Yeah. Subtract some points for that. I had to coach him on that. Yeah, that's true. Your favorite island plug in. If you were stranded on a desert island and can only have one plug in, what would it be? Ooh. It's so tough. Um, it probably would be speakerphone. Oh, okay. mm, yeah. Good job. Good yeah. job, my friend. Get it done? <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. Won the international division. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, I, I, we could have done it in French. I forgot. 
<laughs> no. I don't speak French, but it could have yeah. been fun anyway. <laughs> every, He's every, Australian, so I don't know how we Every answer together. would be croissant, and then we're done. <laughs> Goodness gracious. Um, <laughs> why don't we move on to our, our man, Will Thompson, our producer, is sitting in the corner office. William, how are you? I'm doing great. How about what yourself? Doing, we're good. You got some questions for our guests? I got a lot. I got uh, a lot. I'm sure. So I'm sorting through all of them here, um, but I'll just start right away. So I got three, I got three people that want to know about the track State of the Art. Ah. Damon Martin, Chris Allgood, and Reese Broomfield all reference that as their favorite track. Um, everyone wants to know everything, you know, how you mixed it, automation, panning effects, but mm -hmm. one of the particular questions was, can you mention anything about the pitch shifted vocal on that song and how it came to be? Sure. Uh, so this is a track that started with uh, Wally playing with an organ, and it's a song about uh, fetish of technology. So how you can fall in love with technology and then in years to come, it just seems redundant. Mm -hmm. uh, so the same way that home organs were just the biggest piece of entertainment in the 60s, mm -hmm. they just really took off and everyone had one in their lounge room. And now you can buy one at a thrift store for you know, $50 or you can't get rid of them, you know, it's a thing. And they're such beautiful, some of them are incredible instruments, we're really into, really into organs. Um, and it's the same with, you know, look at an iPad now. An iPad's incredible, you know, you can look at it in 20 years time, it's, yeah. you know, a ridiculous kind of thing. And so this song kind of came out of that. Um, and it was, it's kind of, it's got one of those reggae grooves um, that kind of started from the organ, um, from a cotidian. And uh, uh, it then just morphed into it, it kept going and he kept adding new instruments and new flavors to it. Um, and when it came to adding the vocal to it, it really felt as though it needed some, a voice that was to do with technology. We didn't want to do a straight auto tune on it. Uh, and I played Wally a track from Godly and Cream record, Freeze Frame. So there's a track called I Pity Inabinate Objects on that record. Uh, and it has an amazing pitch shift uh, vocal, very unusual vocal on it. Um, and uh, uh, I was like, oh, this is amazing because it doesn't sound like, it just sounds like another, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound vocodery. It doesn't, you know, we weren't sure what it was. And so we set about trying to recreate that, not knowing what the technology was. It sounded as though, I don't, actually, I don't know how, at the time we didn't know how it was done. Um, and the Sennheiser vocoder. Uh, yeah, uh, we, oh, Kevin Godley got in touch with Wally actually and said that he, he, he thinks he remembers using a, a um, 927, uh, the, the, what's it called? Um, it's Eventide 927, and it had a keyboard that you could attach to it oh, at the yeah. time, and you could play it. Oh, and then it's got wow. manually, you could then do the portamento between notes. Yeah. And I think they played a I, bunch I, of it like I've that. I've seen those, but I never used one. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, we ended up doing it as a, it took three days to do that vocal from the beginning after we recorded it um, as a layering thing. Uh, there's a vocoder, um, a Roland, uh, what's it called, a VCF 350 layer. There's an auto-tune layer that we did, a melodyne layer, um, and they're all manipulated in various ways. But then what happened is you can't really make out the vocal from it. So then I had to go through and cut all the T's and the S's and the F's mm. back into it after the case. Wow. So you can then pronounce, or you can hear all the words being pronounced. So it's a very subtle, so it literally has that all cut back into those. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was a real bitch of a job. Yeah, anyway. Well, <laughs> give us another one. Uh, okay, this one's from the chat room. Um, Alboram, I uh, hope I said that right. Question, when choosing samples, do you have something in mind before you begin the search, or do you flip through samples or listen to records for inspiration? If so, which records did you listen to in regards to somebody that I used to know? Uh, I couldn't, oh, I can't really answer that. I mean, that very much comes from Wall. He has a... I mean, we, go, we do record shopping together and we do those things, but he very much just listens and then finds little moments. And uh, he chooses... His record collection's quite large and really varied. He doesn't really have a um, he doesn't really have a go-to thing. He gets into all sorts of ex exotic things. But if you hear those, a lot of the records that are sampled on uh, certainly on Making Mirrors, there's a lot of exotica. You'll hear a lot of that kind of 60s, 50s, and 60s. You know, Les Baxter um, things that have fairly open little moments in them. Um, uh, so yeah, he delves back into that region quite a, quite a deal. But it also comes, it's more modern, but yeah, most of it's from 60s and into the early 70s. I guess, I guess the answer is this, he's just got great taste and so do you. Just mm. follow your taste and follow your heart. Yeah. Things that tickle whatever that creative yeah. thing is in your Absolutely. brain, Absolutely. follow that. Go ahead, William. This one's from Haima Marriott. 
I, I'm looking forward to like a Joe Frank <laughs> name. It's not going <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> like one day. We're going global. One day, today, man. <laughs> um, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, uh, as a family man, Francois, I'm wondering if you could speak a little about how you balance the deadlines, late nights, and stresses of work with being available, relaxed, and present for your family. Oh, great question. Um, wow. It's a tough thing to do. What I worked out with my wife uh, quite a few years ago, I've been, I'll just let, letting you know, I've been married for 18 years and I have yeah. three, three daughters who are 11, eight, and six. Fabulous. Um, and it's tough to balance, really tough to balance, as everyone kind of knows with that. Uh, with films, one of the reasons why I do only one film a year is that with composition, it requires so much time and effort. Pretty much I'm not in the family for 10 to 12 weeks mm -hmm. because you're doing seven day weeks, 16 hour days. Mm -hmm. And because everyone else in the process is in that, it means that there's no way you can run it to your schedule, you're running to someone else's schedule. Right. So we worked out years ago that basically if I'm gonna take on a film, then I don't have to, because I used to say, I'll be home for dinner or I'll, I'll be home on Sunday. And then mm -hmm. it'd get to Saturday and I wouldn't have finished something. And I'd go, I've just got to go into work again. Mm -hmm. So we just stopped that and made it so that in that time, I was just working, focusing on that. And then I wasn't having to worry about going between the two. We'd set it up, we tried to make it a positive thing that we could set it up so that uh, if we needed a babysitter, if, if, if um, my wife needed uh, help, that we could get extra help for that. And then also I'd get a break at the end of it so I could yeah. then get back into it. So for film, that's very difficult. On records, I try and run it. In Australia, it's a bit different here. I haven't got so much of a schedule. In Australia, I used to try and make it where I was near the studio and I'd be home for dinner time um, and then go back to work. Um, and that really suited me personally. But I think to try and find something that you personally can mm -hmm. enjoy in your life, whatever that may be, in terms of your interaction with your family, if it's possible to talk through that, because I know it put, puts in a huge amount of stress on partners mm -hmm. with the deadlines and the, yeah. And, and, and to your point, <clears throat> we've been talking about, Will and I and Dave, about focusing on that side of the equation. Mm. You know, we have to figure out how we want to do it, or if it's a couple of spouses and we put on our website to do the mm. show. Yeah. Because what I think our audience may not know, when you get at the level that you and Dave are at, that part has to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. It helps your creativity, mm -hmm. it helps your focus, and when it's off balance, it can affect things really badly. So, yeah. so we're gonna cover that and, and figure that out. That's important Unless space. you're writing a bunch of blues songs, but. <laughs> well, you'll end up, you'll end up <laughs> I'm gonna toss something in real quick. Um, for me, I find that when I do have a day off, I try to make it incredibly special. I don't sit and watch TV. I grab the family and we do something spectacular. Take a boat to Catalina, take a drive to, San Diego and spend the day at the zoo, multiple things in the same day. You try to pack the same amount of things a normal family would over the course of a year in a matter of like four or five really long special weekends. Spur of the moment, take the family to Hawaii for a week. I've done that. So you have to do very, you have to do over the top things. You and, know? and for our audience, you have to do whatever it is you're you are able to do. It can be small things. Yeah. But if you're not balanced, right. you can't do balanced That's work. Right. Yeah. And then with children, there's a handful of things you don't miss. You don't miss their graduation. Their third soccer game, you can miss that. The first one, the championship, you can't miss that. Absolutely. You got to, it's very, well, very, one more for very you. difficult. Very difficult. All right, last one. Um, from Marcus Junik. Kala. All right, man. We've had Exotica all show. This is fabulous. I think that's making him up at this point. Okay. Um, question. With all the gear lust and gear obsession today, how do you maintain that tools don't matter attitude? What mental approaches and techniques do you use to forget the gear and focus on the music? Great questions. I do it as a two-layered process. So um, I've got the song, So the well, sorry, three. Looking at the song in the first place, so you're you're really looking at is what's working in the mechanics of this song, do I like it, is the melody, you know, all the basics. And then when you're actually recorded and you've got a production and you're looking at the mix, you're then answering all the technical aspects of it in the, uh, as a session. And I'm really not thinking about the song musically in that. All I'm looking at is trying to get it so it kind of works as a song, flows dynamically, the noises, the, all that stuff's done and then get it through to where it's sounding like a pretty decent mix. And you go, yeah, this sounds pretty good. You play it to someone and they go, yeah, it's, this is really good. Uh -huh. And then I get a bit of time for myself at the end where I'm just really responding to the song on a personal level. And the key for me and where I changed into my 30s from where I was in my 20s is that I used to try and think like that all the time. So I was trying to be in the song. All the time you're working on technically, you're going, 
you know, what is it about this vocal? You're asking all these musical questions and emotional questions through this process where you're just working on it really technically. Mm. You know, like mm. this, I need to DS this vocal. It needs this or it needs that. Yeah, that's true. And then, wow. so if you put all that aside and you actually de-engage with it emotionally, you're not listening to it, you're just going, ah, oh, that's a bit bright. That's a, put it to the side. Um, and then when you're at the end, you can come back and actually have a fresh picture and, a, and an emotion with the song where you go, Oh, I want this to happen, and, you know, and you can make that happen and be engaged creatively and with it, for it and go for boost. it, and you still and you're feeling good about the song. You're not there going, "Oh, I've just spent eight hours, <laughs> right. you know, fixing these things." And that I, that really works for me as a technique. That's great advice. Yeah. Great advice. Here's the question: Will you come back? Sure, I'd love to. Did you have a good time? Oh, I loved it. And most importantly, <laughs> when Dave and I meet Godier. Can we call him Walls? Yeah. We can? <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. you we've, we've got to have you back. Real quickly before you say goodbye to us, um, the, the yin and yang of life is sort of, sort of funny and you kind of have to deal with it. So the, in the last couple of weeks, we've lost a couple of great ones. Great. Phil Ramone, Andy Johns, a few others. So we want to give tribute to that. And I also want to thank you guys. I had a birthday last week overwhelmed at the responses. I just one night just sat and read them and was like, oh my God. So what a pleasure. I'm honored. Thank you so much for all that. And David, take us home. Okay, guys. A lot to, a lot to digest today. And um, um, another thing, when you listen to Francois's records, listen to the way he uses very tight reverbs in, in terms of panning and, and positioning of instruments. I didn't get to that, but I want you to, very important, listen to that. Uh, Herb is totally right. I met Phil Ramone uh, back with Jack Joseph and uh, Tony Maserati and I and Ron Fair and a bunch of guys. We were all in, in San Francisco at a dinner. What an incredible loss that is for our community. We all, there's several people whose shoulders we all stand on and he's certainly one of those. Andy, some of the great Zeppelin records, uh, him and his brother Glenn who's still alive. Very special people. We're going to end on a positive note, though. They're, they're part of our camp. They're part of our community. We love them, and their records will uh, allow us to remember them forever. So let's do that. In the meantime, digest what you've been given, and we'll see you next week.